Welcome to the History of the Batman with London, brought to you by Meltdown Comics and Collectibles in Hollywood, California. This is where we relive the defining moments of one of the most iconic figures in comic art and literature, the Batman. My name is Adam Silverstein, and as always, I am joined by London. From the shadows, we have the mysterious Shadow Adam. History of the Batman with London is produced and engineered by the great Mason Booker. We are here live at Meltdown Comics, and I'd just like to tell you about what's going on here. First of all, we have Meltdown University. It's the school at Meltdown where they teach you the skills to make comic books. Some of the current classes include creating comics, drawing comics for kids, and the art of inking. My kid takes the comic drawing class for kids, and he loves it. Your kid will too. Coming soon, there'll be classes for short film writing, drawing basics, and kids make zines. Go to MeltComics.com and enroll now. Also like to tell you about Meltthology. Meltthology is a monthly comics jam at Meltdown every third Tuesday of the month. Here's how it works. Show up at Meltdown at 7 p.m. Draw a page of whatever you want. All skill levels are welcome. 9.30, the art is collected three dollars because when you come back next month a complete zine with everyone's contributions will be available for you please come to meltology it is amazing also please check out kamikaze it is la's own pop culture convention happening august i'm sorry october 30th to november 1st if you go on the website KamikazeExpo.com. You can enter the promo code MELT, M E L T, and guess what? You're going to get a discount. So go to Kamikaze. It's going to be amazing. And by the way, it's Stan Lee's Kamikaze special guest this year, aside from Stan, Grant Morrison. Don't miss it. If you're a History of the Batman fan, you know the contributions Grant Morrison made. So go check them out. Also, like to have you sh- check out. Disney Click, it's another podcast by The Great Meltdown. It's where everything in the Magic Kingdom is discussed. There's also Meltcast 3.0, where the Meltdown employees talk new comics and get into other shenanigans. We have on YouTube, The Digital Lizards of Doom. It's Meltdown's very own YouTube show where Gabe and Dan explore all aspects of pop culture. You never know what's going to happen there, except that it's going to be good. This week on History of the Batman, we have the amazing, amazing Kelly Jones, London's favorite Batman artist of all time. London? Yes. For this episode, we have a very special guest. Very special guest. And he is my favorite Batman artist. And I get that question asked tons. And I'm so excited that he's going to be a guest on our show and it is the one and only kelly jones so hi kelly (laughs) well first of all thank you very much for that there's a lot of very good people who do this so when someone says that that does mean a lot because for me mine was marshall rogers so he's the one who got me into all this yes and Um, yes and for me the first comic that I ever saw was Batman 497, The Broken Bat, and you did that cover, which is now yep. iconic. And just the visual of that, it made me want to get into Batman comics and get into your work. And I've come across tons of different Batman artists and creators, and your depiction of Batman and your style has always been my personal favorite. Well, let me first say I appreciate that more than you know. <laughs> and secondly, with that cover, if I'd have known that it would be what it was, I would have been too scared to draw it. I had no idea. <laughs> it's one of those, you just, you know, they call you up, they say on Tuesday, they call you up and they say, we need it. And Thursday, it's got to be in the office. So you have no time to think. Is, oh, wow. is that, so, was that the process for that cover? Was it really that uh, quick of a turnaround? Pretty much all the early ones because they, they um, were running so late. And okay. they were trying to coordinate all, you know, all the books to be tied to one another. I, at that same time, was working on Red Rain stories. That's right. So I, I, um, 
I wasn't involved in, I knew what was going on, but I didn't know what was going on. So I'd say, well, who's in it? What's going on? And sometimes they knew and sometimes they didn't know. I mean, they would know sort of, kind of. <laughs> and when it came to that particular cover of 497, that was one that they had said, um, he gets his back broken. Mm. <laughs> and I said, okay, by Bane. And <laughs> how, how you do that was, for me, the only way I could think of was that way. So I sent in a sketch. Normally, I never did sketches. I just drew them. But on that one, they kind of wanted to see how I would do it because that's fairly gruesome. Yeah. Definitely. And uh, I sent that in. They approved it and uh, faxed it in, I should say. And I just sat down and knocked it out that afternoon and then boxed it up and sent it by FedEx. Wow. It's and that was that. I didn't think any more of it. I didn't think any more of it <laughs> until like many years later How? Oh, yes. when people would say that what that cover meant to them. Um, to me, it was uh, – I because I was involved in other things, uh, usually with that – I always thought of them as movie posters right? during right. Nightfall and each, Night Quest each, and stuff like that. Each cover was a movie poster? Is that how you approached yeah, each I, cover? Yeah, because I wasn't invested. I didn't know what was really going on in the story, and they would just say – uh, Batman's in a sewer, so I draw Batman with rats on his head. Right. Or, you know, <laughs> Batman, Batman's doing something. I would or just Batman's say, with Scarecrow. And you, right. Right. And so you would just draw. Is that more difficult to kind of create that cover when you don't really know the context of the story? Or you just kind of go well, with the For me, I've always, worked, <laughs> I've, always felt, I've always felt less information is better. Oh, because really? then you, yeah, then you have to come up with something that's really catchy. And I always felt very responsible to the people writing and drawing them then that I had to do something good to sell them. Right. Um, and at that time, sometimes I would know what was going on. Sometimes I wouldn't, they didn't give, they didn't go into great detail. Did they give you a lot but of they notes would tell on me, each cover? No. It would just be a conversation on a, like I said, it would be a conversation on a Monday, draw it on a Tuesday, mail it on a Wednesday. Wow. That's a really so quick process, I don't it remember. seems like. <laughs> well, you, I got really into, I, and I had to keep my other deadlines going. So I would tell them, you know, um, we have to keep this. And they knew that because I was doing, uh, like I said, I was doing uh, some of the prestige series stuff for them at that time. So it was, it was, I, and I knew the guys doing it. So if I really had a question, I could call them. But generally speaking, it was just, I knew what would grab me if I was trying to, if I was going to buy a book. So I would always say, well, Batman's got to be first and foremost, really prominent. And it's got to be, like I said, a movie poster. So they had to be catchy. And when I first took it, I was, not really slated to do them. Um, they had initially hired Sam Keith to do them. Oh, okay. And that was because I knew Sam. And uh, I, was doing, Sam, I was doing stuff Sa for them, and they said uh, they wanted contact to, for Sam. And then Sam did one or two, but then he just froze up. He Sam had Keith a hard from the, time. You're talking Sam Keith who did the Max? Yes. Okay. And, and we were friends, and he, he and I would draw a lot in my kitchen. So and where where, um, where is this? Put us in that place. Where is this? Is it in Sacramento? This is in this is in Sacramento, and we knew each other from high school. So he started doing uh, the Max and well, actually at that time Wolverine, mm -hmm. and I had just done Dead Man. So at that time, he had done a few little snippets with Batman. I had done a few little snippets with Batman. And I was and I had done Red Rain, and so they had called and said, "Do you have Sam's contact number?" Because he was working at Marvel, and uh, that started one. It started because the editor said, "We're looking for someone to do it," and I had said, "Boy, Sam would be great." And then a few days later, they called and said, "Do you have his contact?" And after he had been called to do it, after a few issues, he had just said he just didn't feel comfortable with it and so he'd come over and we'd work on some together and I, I thought he was doing great it's just sometimes that happens and and i've had that happen to me and he just kind of froze up during that 
And at that point, then they called me and said, um, you know, we're really behind on Detective and on Batman. We need five or six covers uh, by late next week. So you have to do them. Mm. And that's how it started. So I just said, tell me what's in each issue or tell me what each issue number is about. They did. And then I just sat down and made a point to knock out six and six days, you know, pencil and ink one a day. Wow. Did them, turn them in. And I thought that would be the end of it. And I thought that would pay the, you know, that would pay that debt. And, um, about a month or so later, two months or so, I should say, then they got a hold of me and said, Hey, these are going over real well. Um, we'd like you to continue doing that. So what a great call, huh? <laughs> it, it, well, it, it was and it wasn't because I was really doing all this other stuff. You know, I, I think I was doing at that time I was doing Batman and uh, finishing a Batman thing, doing a dead man thing. And, um, so it was a lot, uh, there was a lot to do and I had no idea who knew that that would be a big deal, <laughs> you know? And I was, I was friends with all the guys doing them. So you can't really say no. And then it just sort of took a life of its own for the next few years. Right. So you and Sam Keith went to the same high school? No, we, I went to, I went to, we were at high school at the same time, but I was, he was going to a different one and I knew his cousin. I mean, and then we met, uh, through a mutual, through a mutual friend of, of ours. And we, um, got to look at each other's stuff and uh, became friends at that point. And he was as into his stuff. We were into very similar things and similar approaches. We both started as anchors. Um, never thought we'd have careers as pencilers, much less any career at all. So it was a very similar thing. And um, I had, we were, we were influencing each other at that time. Um, when I was at Marvel in the late eighties, he's the one who went to DC and said, look, you got to come over. And cause he knew I wasn't really happy at Marvel then. And, uh, and I did, and we worked together a little bit there. And then he went on and did Sandman and I went on and did dead man and whatever. And so it just, it was, it sort of worked out that way. And we've known each other ever since. Well, that's great. That is. And it's interesting that having to put out the Batman and Detective Comics covers kind of quickly and you had a little bit of context to work with and you said previously that you were working on Red Rain around the same time and for those listening that don't know that is a whole three issue Elseworld series and it is now known as the Vampire Batman and so working on Red Rain which is probably my favorite Elseworlds, that series, because of your depiction of Batman, knowing when you were approached to do that, were you, did you feel like you were just in your element? Because it seems like the way that the vampire Batman is, the character Batman itself, is a dark and gloom, shadowy figure all by itself. So the way that you thought of drawing Batman, did that just fit perfectly within that story? Or did you kind of have to work with the writer? And how was that dynamic putting out that series? It, well, at first, uh, because I'd worked with Malcolm Jones on Sandman, he knew Doug Minch. And Doug Minch is the one who had this idea. I didn't know anything of the of of the outline of it. I had just uh wanted to work with uh, uh with Malcolm anyway and he had said, "Hey, Doug Minch really liked that dead man you did and he liked some other stuff he's seen. Um he wanted to talk to you about maybe doing something with him." And so I was terrified because Doug was <laughs> Doug Minch and he had written so many books I'd loved. Um, I was crestfallen because I was so stupid that when he said, yeah, Batman versus Dracula, I thought that was stupid. <laughs> I just went, Oh God, I didn't, and I had no courage to say that to him, but he said, let me send you the outline. Well, when I read the outline, my 
outlook completely changed because it was it was originally called uh, um, uh, what was it now uh, uh, something in Scarlet I forget now uh, I can't remember but I still have the outline with you now um, oh, really. Wow, <laughs> And so and it was very well written. It was very, it was all, I mean, enough to where I read it that, uh, and it was the proposal that he sent into uh, Danny O'Neill. Well, when I read it, it was brilliant. Right. And it was all those things. I didn't approach it purely as a horror thing. I just wanted to draw Batman. I figured it was the only chance I'd ever get to do Batman. So I was going to take it. And, um, and Doug is a brilliant Batman writer. One of Definitely. to me, he was one of my favorite Batman writers up to that point. And um, anyway, I had once I read it, and then he changed the title to Red Rain. And there, there was no intent of doing sequels. It was a one and done. Okay. And uh, very gothic. Yes. <laughs> in that nobody nobody survives basically, you know. Right. And um, and he wrote it. With such, you know, when you do something that is called Batman versus Dracula, that can sound really silly. So you have to take it very seriously. And he did. So I really picked up on his taking it seriously. Right. And yeah. um, and at that point, I just went in and I had just come off stuff like Dead Man. No one, there weren't really horror comics in the mainstream anymore. I mean, there was Swamp Thing did its thing. But Dead Man was... Uh, the calling card. And I was desperately looking for that kind of material. So when this came along and it was horror oriented and Doug had an affection for it and felt that dead man went or uh, Batman went with that. Um, it became easy to do. And also you have to remember at that time they had put a lot of their promotion and, and, and their focus on and what they should have on uh, Simon Bisley and Alan Grant's Batman Judge Dredd. So we were left alone. Oh, okay. I see. We weren't expected to do much business. I never took that as poorly because when I saw Simon's work, I went, yeah, no doubt. <laughs> this is this is what I would put all my chips on too. So um, we were left alone and I turned it in. And uh, for whatever reason, it sold out in a weekend. And it shocked them. It shocked us. We were stunned. I knew when they sent me an advanced copy, it was going to be good. So I thought, well, you know, after a year or so, they should sell out. Um, this is this is because it then in those days, hardcovers were rare, and twenty five bucks a pop is you just don't expect to sell out. And this is ninety one, right? Yes. So when it sold out, uh, it was released on a Thursday and gone by Saturday. Wow. <laughs> um, DC called and told us that, and I was, uh, I was completely shocked. At that point, um, where did DC want to continue with the second Bloodstorm? Since you said it was a one know, shot originally, how yeah, did that happen? I don't. I, there wasn't talk like that then. There was more talk was, well, should we put it in a, a trade paperback edition? That was the question oh, okay. because they didn't reprint hardcovers. Oh. And it was a very different time marketing wise. We weren't beating the door down for that. I went back to uh, I had been hired to to do a sequel to Dead Man under Archie Goodwin, and uh, Doug had said, "Look, you know, I want to do some more stuff with you. Let's figure it out." But there was not the natural thing of let's do a sequel. Oh, and then about a year or two later, um, DC came to us and said, "You know." That sold out, and the trade paperback and is is in its second or third printing. Maybe you guys, if you want, think about doing a sequel. And Doug's idea was having at, it, it was a very good one, having the Joker come in and kind of fill the void of the missing Dracula. Yes, mm -hmm. and not because not that he ever became a vampire. He traded with the vampires that they didn't make him one as long as he. Uh, could could run the gang pretty well, right? And um, and that was a great idea. And, and I think so one at of that the... point it became a natural it became a natural thing. Yes, you yeah. yeah at that point, sure. 
yeah, to continue that story. And like you said, Joker's appearance in that second tale is really powerful. And I and on on the show, we've talked about the dynamic between Batman and Joker and how they have this very interesting relationship where one needs the other. Whereas in this story, which is in Elseworlds and it's out of continuity, and then Batman essentially kills Joker and then he feels sorry and he and it's just it's a very powerful panel that you did because I've always been interested to know would Batman ever take Joker out would he ever do that to him and in this story it just shows that that type of Batman I think that's the that vampire Batman that just dark it's way past vigilante. It's like something out of a nightmare. And I think for Batman to kill Joker, in a sense, that is definitely the epitome of any nightmare that any of his rogues could see of him. So I think filling that void with Joker in that way was something that I think probably pushed to the last chapter for Crimson Mist in 99. Was that kind of, since was Bloodstorm as successful as Red Rain, I, or how? Yeah, they were, I, we we found what was really good was each one did better than the last one. Okay, yeah. And what what happened with with Bloodstorm was Doug had said, well, you know, the only guy who can fill the shoes of Dracula will be Joker. <laughs> and then he said, and the thing that pushes Batman over is he finally will succumb to fi- taking blood from a victim. It has to be the Joker. That makes it sense. It can't be some regular person. <laughs> it's That's the one that he kills him, but that's where he becomes full-fledged, full-fledged vampire. Yes. And he that... says, we're going to work up to that moment. And I remember him saying, they're going to think we planned this. <laughs> but it's one of those things that just naturally evolved. And um, for me... Uh, it was something that when you're handling characters like this and everyone knows the great prohibition Batman has over, you know, he takes, he takes criminals to Gordon. Right. So for him to do that, that's a big deal. Elseworlds or elseworlds or not. And, um, so we really planned that one out and we talked about it a lot. And then, then when he, uh, we finally got to the point where we were doing it, we were very conscious of that point. And um, again, we thought once that it, one was done, that would be it. <laughs> um, you know, you do, you think. And and when I finished that, I went on and did three years on the monthly, and that was kind of what how it all went. You know, we we didn't think about. You just didn't. You, you know, you thought, wow. The the thing that came to us was we survived doing a sequel that didn't like stink up the joint, and it was because Red Rain had been a commercial and critical hit. You didn't want to. Re- I mean, I was afraid of ruining that. And uh, then Bloodstorm came out and did the same thing, and it was wow. Okay, there was, so there was a great deal of relief. Um. But every moment in – there was some really amazing stuff. Even now I look back on it. When you're doing it, you're not as aware of it being shocking until you can step back. And now I look and I go, wow, what was I thinking that day? <laughs> you I, that, know, I, that's, pretty, that's pretty violent stuff or that's pretty, pretty intense stuff. Right. At that point when you and Doug had come out with those two series, was that your – you know, the highest level of success or critical success and yeah. that you had reached yeah. at that point. Yeah. So, because they both did the same thing. They both sold out in a few days. So and th- these were, these were expensive books. So I never assumed anyone's going to, I, it's hard for me to part for 20 with 25 bucks. <laughs> right. So I was, and then I even was in 90s. grateful, just terribly grateful. Now, when you and Doug put this together, I mean, this is a, quite a partnership that you two had formed. Yeah. And how how was that working together? I mean, to reach this level well, he, together. He was he was to me very intimidating because you got to remember he had written so many books that I was a big fan of when I was just buying comics off the rack. So when you come into it, um it's like John Lennon says he likes you. 
<laughs> right. Right. <laughs> and he wants to, he wants to write some songs with you, and you go, you have to get over that. And but he you, was you every did. Bit but you had an entire run, like you said, that was right after Bloodstorm, and it kind of came right before Crimson Mist. Well, he wasn't happy. He was not happy that we did that. I took that job. Really? He had other things in mind. He didn't know they were going to do that. What had happened was Archie Goodwin. Archie Goodwin had initially got me to do the first Batman piece ever, and that was a cover to Detective Comics. And that was uh, before Red Rain and everything. And he had just called me one day, and Archie had said, I really like your dead man. Have you ever drawn Batman before? And I said, no. And he says, how about if you do me an inventory cover, and um, we'll see how that goes. And I did it, and he really liked it. Well, at the same time, all this other stuff was going on with Doug and Danny O'Neill. And so after Bloodstorm, Archie Goodwin called me and said, if you want, I would like you to do a six-issue series for me, and we can sit down and talk about it with Batman. But before I do, I'll ask Danny O'Neill, because uh, Danny was in charge of all Batman stuff. And when he did, Denny had said, I kind of have in mind they were going to have a change on the regular pencil on Batman. I was going to ask Kelly. And if Kelly says he doesn't want to do it, then feel free. But if Kelly does, I would like him to do Batman as a regular book. I didn't know any of this actually until afterwards. <laughs> um, so anyway, Denny calls. I say yes in two seconds because I had – in my mind, to be a real artist, you got to do a monthly for a while. And that's really where you learn to become an artist, and you are legitimate. I mean, if you if you can spend a year on a book, it should be good. But if you got to do one every month, and you got to do everyone for two or three years, at three years minimum, that's where you prove whether you are a real comic book artist or not. Right. And, and um, so... When they said, we'd like you to do this, I said, absolutely. Doug wasn't happy because Doug wanted to do all these other special projects. And I told Doug what this meant to me, and he came right back, and he says, okay, you cannot be late. You have to be on time, and we're going to do the stories I always wanted to write but never really had a compatriot to do it with. And I said, fine. And... um and it really went from there. And and I think those uh, that was that was our agreement together. To, and and then we went to DC and said, because the, all the books had been tied together, we'd ask the only thing we we're going to ask is that our books aren't tied to the other books. Hmm. And that way, if people didn't like us, so be it. They didn't, and and that way they didn't have to buy fifteen books to follow us. And if they did like us, you know. They'll st- if they still want to buy the others, fine, and they can buy us. Th- there was no holding a gun to someone's head. Um, and frankly, I don't I don't play well with others that way, you know, um, because I wouldn't know what to do if I had in a seven part story and I had part four, I wouldn't be very good. So, um, and they agreed, you know, it's the last time Batman was left like that. So I had carte blanche to, as long as I was on time, we could do what we wanted to do. And um, so Doug started writing these really idiosyncratic, very eccentric stories. I was already kind of drawing that way. So it just worked um, as uh, – it, it felt different and read different. I love the idea of like a one shot or a two shot, and then you move on to something else. They, they, you could get really to the core of things. Um, and I always felt that people buying them would feel like this is like what comics should be. They're not. They're just you like them or you don't. And if you didn't like what we were doing, well, next month maybe you will. You know, it was it was such a low pressure sales approach. Um, and then, and then, like I said, it gave us a chance, uh, Doug had what he wanted to do. He'd say, who do you want to draw? I say, well, I'd love to do Killer Croc. I'd love to have Swamp Thing in it. I'd love to do, uh, Scarecrow, all these characters I wanted to do yeah, and you, just 
see what we can and see what we can get out of it. And 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 the thing about a short story is you have to be really good and to the point. Right. Before you got on the air with us, you told us about Mr. Freeze. Can you briefly tell us about that? Because you were listening to our last one of our past episodes. Yeah, and yeah, that and and well, for Mr. Freeze, uh, I got to do one issue. I had initially wanted to do uh, two or three issues, but they didn't like Mr. Freeze because they associated him with the uh, kind of the over-the-top, silly '60s stuff. And, um, I had, I had felt like, well, to me, Mr. Freeze, freezing someone to death was a horrible death to me. And there, I saw more the horror of it. Right. And that a character like this, uh, seemed perfect fit into the rogues gallery. He hadn't been there in forever. And I wanted to kind of introduce reintroduce one and so i told him look I, i'll i have a redesign in my head and i you know and i was told all the way up to denny no they don't he doesn't want to do it no he doesn't want to do it finally denny got on the phone he says i i hate mr freeze he's a silly character and he's not been portrayed in the comics uh, very well. And then, you know, he always thought of the silly Vincent Price stuff or whoever did it back then, um, Otto Preminger or whatever. And I said, look, I don't see him that way. I f- sent him my redesign of the character as it appeared in 525, I believe. Um, and I kept saying, Denny, he's going to, he, he'll be frightening. And it'll be one. It, and he finally says, I can't see three issues of it. I can't see two. I said, one issue then. And uh, so Doug, Doug got on there and he says, look, let me write one issue and we will never ask for anything again because we begged to have Swamp Thing in the book. So they're getting tired of us asking for things. Um, I said, I just let me have one shot at it. So I redesigned it and it was such a hit. They recast the film from the Patrick Stewart version to an Arnold Schwarzenegger version. So I apologize. Wow. For that. <laughs> <laughs> but they had to, the, the people doing the film really liked that issue. Right. Wow. And saw him from being kind of uh, a more tongue in cheek to, he could be a lot more frightening enough to where the, you know, he started, Mr. Freeze started appearing in other books. Oh yeah. Yes. Definitely and um, and and I never, if you notice, I never got to use him again because Denny still didn't like him after that. <laughs> and you, you know, and it's Denny O'Neill, so you go, yes, sir, Mr. O'Neill. Right. Um, right. And I was always grateful he gave me one shot at it. So, uh, but when the toy came out, you know, I was deeply gratified because it was, you know, it's what we had done. Hopefully, they sent uh, I think you it was one. The same yeah, it was the same with the Scarecrow. They weren't negative on the Scarecrow, but I got to kind of rework the Scarecrow, too. And uh, so when they make little figures out of it, it you, you always hope that carries more weight when you ask for something. Right. And um, you having, you're able to reimagine characters on that run. It's interesting because your stylized Batman was, like you said, different from the Batman that in the regular Batman and detective comics and you, your series was kind of separate from the others. And so people can read it in a different way. It doesn't have to follow the whole line. And you said people either liked it or they didn't. Did you get a lot of negative feedback from people who were actually we reading went, your series? The book went, it's one of those great things that, that you, uh, one, it wouldn't have mattered anyway to me okay. because <laughs> I always figured I was speaking to the right people. Right. Right. I mean, you do that. And that sounds all brave and wonderful. <laughs> but I, I but that really what had happened was the book went from about 200 letters a month to eight or nine hundred letters a month. Uh, and out of that, I remember Doug calling me. He says, hey, you know, um, I'm only getting like five or six negative letters out of seven or eight hundred letters here. Wow. And he says, this is really going over well. Whatever you're doing, keep doing it. That was uh, – because I would just say, what do you think? Now, I didn't go in there thinking I was doing something radically different because I came from being a fan of uh, the 70s era. 
Okay. So I would go from Walt Simonson to Bernie Wrightson to, uh, like I said, Marshall Rogers, uh, Neil Adams. They were all very different. Right. And no one said anything, you know. Um, and it was Marshall Rogers that got me. He was my big hero. And he had big long ears and a weird cape. <laughs> yes. He was, just, he was just technically a brilliant artist. And that was my favorite book. And I couldn't look. In fact, I never looked at Marshall's stuff while I did it. I couldn't even have him around <laughs> because they were too much of an influence. So I started going to, to the things that influenced me were um, out, generally they were always outside of comics. So I was a big fan of old 40s film noir stuff old universal horror films. So I started. So those were your that. influences. Into yeah. And I brought that atmosphere to the books. I always said, whether Batman's on the page or not, I wanted it to feel like a Batman book. Right. And, and there's Gotham so many different. Character. Yes. There, and there's so many different types of, of Batman, of just Batman's in general. And for, see, I think a lot of people see in, in yours where you kind of have a stylized, almost a supernatural type of Batman, just the way with the elongated ears. Well, he and should scare so, people. Right. He, should, he, should, he was a guy who, to me, should he would scare you. The vast majority of Gothamites would never return to crime if he would <laughs> showed up. Right? Exactly. That was the end of it. You had to be a crazy guy who went to Arkham Asylum to keep doing this. I always saw Batman's recidivism rate as less than 1%. Because he would just show up in your house and say, do not steal again. And that was it. You didn't steal anymore. And it was just how he looked. And, and I always also thought, and I used to tell Doug this, I said, you know, I see him, the, the regular Gotham people, regular citizens, they don't know if he's a good guy or not. I always saw the bat signal as a warning. <laughs> he's loose. And if he's loose, he's the worst one of the rogues gallery. And when you see him fighting the Rose Gallery, if anyone does, it's over turf. So every and he always wins. So there's sheer terror if you're some stick up man or whatever. Um, and so it should always be that just him there with that roiling cape and those long ears and him pointing at you and knowing you and you would say, He looked at me. That was enough. And so I always drew him that way. In fact there's several times I'd have him pointing at people saying, Stop it. <laughs> And they, would, yeah. and they would stop it. And they would stop it. <laughs> when, you know? W- right. And when you were drawing Batman, were there other comics or comic artists? You, you mentioned Marshall Rogers, but were there other influences in comics while you were doing them in that Not time? in comics, no. Not in I comics? Was, I was, no, I didn't. A comic, I had always been very much a film student. Okay. So I learned how to draw comics from film class. I never took, I never took art classes. I never did that. Um, one, because I never thought I would draw comics. So I was, I was much more interested in film. So I would go, well, what if Orson Welles directed a Batman story? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, what if, what if, uh, what if you had Billy Wilder and, Raymond Chandler write a Batman story. So I was always coming from that angle. And so film became very important to me on how I depicted him because one, I wasn't, I didn't feel good enough to compete with Marshall, much less Neil Adams or any of the other greats. You don't compete with them. So you got to come up with something different. And I kind of learned that from dead man was that how do you compete with Neil Adams? You don't. So you got to come up with something completely different. And uh, with Dead Man, it was making him look the way he did. And that worked. So when it came to Batman, which again, Neil cast a long shadow, it was the more gothic approach. The more f- uh, and so I figured if I mix James Whale and Billy Wilder with Orson Welles, I'll get something different. Right. And I think that that's a great approach, especially since when Batman was first created, it was from the pulp fiction comics and just that noir and gothic sense. So I feel that your Batman, which is different from probably most, it's you have a very unique take, I think fits perfectly into what Batman represents. Like you said, he's, he's a figure that if you see him, you don't want to see him ever again. He's something, out of, he's something out of a nightmare. And 
it fits even if the book isn't for Halloween or anything of that no, nature. And, and it can look, be for any time of the year. <laughs> well, it is. And you got to remember, this guy says, I'm going to strike fear into people, right? Exactly. He doesn't say, I'm going to beat them up and drag them off and have them have their due process. Right. He says, I'm going to strike fear into these people. They're cowards. So I, I took that literally. And... I remember in doing it, Doug had always said, well, you know, a big part of the influence of the creation of Batman was Sherlock Holmes. So he was big on the detective angle. Right. You know, with the little devices and the little, uh, you know, how how he would collect evidence and clues to point to him. So those things worked out very well together because I always said, you know, if James Whale directed a Batman and Arthur uh, – Arthur, Conan Doyle wrote one that Whale directed. That was always the approach every month. If they were scary, they were scary. But it was scary because his intent was to do that. Um, I always felt that that Batman in and of himself uh, was not this conflicted, tormented guy or whatever. He was a guy who set out on a mission and was going to accomplish it. And he kept trying to save that little kid that he was over and over and over again. It was really just as simple as that. Right. And the fear he went through, he was going to put into the people doing these all this mayhem. It, it really was as simple as that. And from that point, then when you're sitting drawing it, you go... That cape's got to do more than just sit there. Yes, I was and just going he, to ask. Your capes are amazing, and they have a life of their own. <laughs> How did you, in a way, develop your your own cape? You kind of there is a Kelly Jones cape, and there's a Kelly Jones cowl in the ears. Those are really distinct features in your Batman, and it's so dramatic. Where did though? Where did that come from? Well, for me. I didn't want him to just be – a lot of books tend to be the same if they're similar. Like I didn't want it to be Captain America but in Gotham. You know what I mean? It was yes. like he had to be different. So I sat down – when I, I started with Red Rain, and I thought, well, how do I make him compete with something like Dracula? And, and one of the things I did was thought that this cape – because I'd come off Sandman, which is a fairly static book. He, it's a talking book. You know? Yes. So I used to make the cape do stuff, and I used to try to come up with different tricks to make it visually interesting to support the word balloons. And then when it came to Batman, I thought it then went further and said, it, he wears this to scare people. What good does it do him otherwise? Right. Right? He comes in and out of this thing. It should move around. It doesn't matter. I don't – I'm not from the school of everything's got to be – clearly explained and the school of realism. I think the re more realistic something gets, the less eccentric and the less comic book it is, less fun it is. The more we become like other media, the less fun it is. Too. Right. And I think a lot of fans, they like their Batman to be realistic because he's human, but then he is imaged off of a bat, a scary figure. So it's almost as if it's okay for Batman at times to be realistic, but then really if you look at the actual character itself, your interpretation to me makes a lot of sense. It's to strike fear in the hearts of criminals and that Well I always wanted I always wanted my Batman period to be one that that was the fear of this guy. So the book just dripped with it. I enjoyed the subsequent years quite a bit that it became kind of a cult book. Right. Because, because it wasn't tied to big events and didn't have big things going on. They were never really reprinted. They never were, actually. And I would have people say, does that bug you? And I said, no, because DC said, you know, if you tie it together, they'll be reprinted. They weren't being mean or anything they said this is what it takes to get reprinted <laughs> and i'd said well doug and i thought about it and i said i can't let's just do it the way we do because we're only getting one shot to do this really and let's just do it this way 
And over the years after I, you know, the, the fourth year they had said, we would love you to do it again. We were selling tremendously. We were the number one selling book though at DC for the majority of that three years. And normally it was Superman (laughs) and all the Superman related titles, then Batman. We had leapt over that. And And this was after Nightfall. And we were the number one selling book DC had for that roughly two years and eight months. And I think it's because it was so different visually and the writing. There was no obligation. There was just no obligation to people. If they liked it, they liked it. If they didn't, they didn't. If they didn't buy it, they weren't. It wasn't going to screw up their Batman experience. Right. And it was so different. You could get people into it. You could hand them an issue and they weren't committed to two years of something. Right. And that helped a lot. Did you get pushback so on I your style? The, did you get what pu- was that? Did you get pushback on your style from fans that weren't um, used to this and were looking for something else? Well, Be- what happens? What happens is I enjoyed it actually. Nice. <laughs> and if you don't get a polarization, nobody knows who you are. If you don't get people saying something that can be taken either way, you didn't really. It didn't matter. So when someone (laughs) says to me, you know, Kelly did it, that could be great. That could be bad. But I knew because what was happening was I was getting the right people telling me they liked it. And I was getting people who said, I quit buying it, but I'm buying this. So I knew whatever I was losing, I was picking up. I also knew the letters page is pretty good gauge. And so we were getting a tremendous enthusiasm for it. Uh, the, I never went around and felt, I, in fact, I used to say I'm never going to justify what I do. If you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. I'll keep, I'll be quiet. It turned out they did. And look, I mean, here it is 20 years later and I'm on another Batman series. Right. right. Not a lot of people from that time <laughs> are around doing it anymore. And even with your um, other series like Haunted Gotham and Gotham After Midnight, did you have the same type of approval or not of those books when you did those series or what, well where I was lucky was when I did Gotham After Midnight and Batman Unseen which were mm-hmm. in the late 2000s right um, that was from at that editor was named Michael Seglane and he was someone who said boy when you first did Batman in the 90s I hated it and then after three issues you were the only guy I could think of who could draw Batman wow what and a he nice became compliment. a passionate fan. Yeah, well, <laughs> the best ones are the ones you convert. You know, that is like being a vampire. I bit them and they became fans. Um, it but all it makes is. sense one now. Those, it does. So I was always very pleased with that. That he And he told me that. He says, so um, I don't know if lightning strikes twice, but I would like to do some Batmans with you. And uh, I said, sure. Um and I went to town on them, and I thought they came out really well. They did very well. They did really well. And it was one of those things where, you know, you get awards for it, and you get acknowledgement, and MTV did a thing on these things. And I went, wow, that's okay. <laughs> you know? You try – at that point, that affirmation's good, but the best one was the people who would say – this is really different. I didn't think I'd like it, but I really like this. Now, I never sat down and said I'm going to be different. I always thought I was fairly mainstream because I come from – I was a fan of so many 70s era books. Right. Um, but after a while, you know, I'm not stupid. I look around and I go, okay, I don't count the treads on his boot. <laughs> I don't um, try to figure out the length of his cape every panel. Um, I'm trying to capture an atmosphere, a mood, uh, something that 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 uh, makes the book, like I said, feel like Batman, whether he's in the panel or not. Those kind of things are what I'm after. And if I can get that, then I think that I've I've uh, I, I've done something that is to me essential to to making a good. Batman comic. What were some of the things you liked to draw aside from Batman? Because you mentioned when even he's not in the panel, you're still making it a Batman comic. Were there any other things like the Batmobile or the Bat Signal or 
the bat cave. Well, I the mean, bat signal I turned, the bat signal I took, and I remember thinking, well, they have it just be a, like a spotlight, like a you know for a movie opening. And I took um, uh, the 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 uh, housing of a of a howitzer cannon and used that because I thought that would be good. And then I just put a spotlight in the middle of that. But primarily the thing I loved drawing was Gotham City itself. And so I took many elements. In some parts, it was going to look like um, an Eastern European city. Other parts, it would look like a modern American city. Uh, New York is where it comes from. So I think, well, the Dutch invented it. So you wouldn't be surprised if you saw in some outer part of it some windmill or something. I know that sounds silly, but for Gotham would work. I, it was very anachronistic. So you would have a steam engine in New York or Gotham. You would have people still having uh, older telephones right next to a brand new computer. And no one would think anything of it. Right. And yeah. it was those kind, those kind of things yeah. that, made, that made it far more interesting of a place to draw. I didn't I, – I'm such not a realistic guy in the pure sense. I don't mind realism, but I don't like it to be the thing to where it becomes restrictive. Um, at that point, I don't want to know that every time I go to the Batcave, it's the same thing. Some of the same stuff's there, like the dinosaur and the penny, but the rest of it's always changing. There's a many, many little cavernous alcoves in the Batcave – Never really would I want to see the same one twice because that's just cool to me and mysterious. Um, I agree with your with your Gotham City, how you depict it. It has a life of its own and it is very dark and there's misty streets and it you feel as if Batman fits right into it or if someone's walking down the street and they're a criminal that he would emerge from the shadows and it all is very has an atmosphere to it and it's not just oh this is the city and this is the hero and this is the bad guy it all kind of flows and even if you have no idea what is coming next on the next page you already have a story in itself just looking at the illustrations because like I said, they have a very unique life of their own. And I think that's important for any comic. And I think a lot of some, there are artists that don't really have that aspect in their work, trying to make something completely separate or on its own, even without the storyline. I believe that your art can have, it, there could be no words and it can tell a story just all on its own. Well, I Thank you for that. Part of part of it was that I didn't want to, on a very practical level, feel that I only could be excited that day if I had Batman exploding through a window beating up somebody. So I wanted to be exciting every day. And what could I bring through? What new camera angle? What new thing could I show? Whether Batman was on that page or not. And so it came to me that I, I loved doing the back alleys. And they could be, and I remember looking at uh, these old, uh, I'd been overseas and just going into the uh, back streets and the, the back alleys and whatnot, which were, you know, hundreds of years old, if not a thousand years old. And I kept thinking, this is exactly the way Gotham should look. And it always just stuck in my head. So when I got that opportunity to do it, I would tell them, I said, look, I, uh, I remember getting a call one day and they said, Kelly, there's steam coming out of a train, <laughs> you know? And I went, yeah, because you know what? They, they have a very strong train union there that didn't want to give up the steam people, didn't want to give up their jobs. I don't know. It's there, <laughs> you know? Um, it, uh, if we get into the explanation, then the whole house of cards comes down. Right. So what I wanted was someone to sit there and feel the coziness of the creepiness. Nice. Like and you said, that's nice. And said. That's right there. Just, <laughs> you know, that's just how it was. That should be the title of this and podcast. I, yes. The coziness <laughs> of, of the, the creepiness. creepiness. I agree. <laughs> well, don't you think, don't you think years after, 
you want to uh, there's so much material that's been published and will be published. So I always felt if you're going to stand out, it's got to stand out. And even if people, um, even if people go, this isn't their cup of tea, I knew they would warm up to it. And finally, when they, for example, when they did reprint it, they sold out of the reprint. And it was another one of those things. They called me up and they said, geez, we're, we don't have any. After a week and a half, we have no copies of this thing. And we printed a lot of them. And part of it is none of those books have been reprinted. The other part of it was, I think, this intangible. That when you started reading it, it felt more like a Batman book than you expected it to. And they were the kind of stories you did want to revisit. I, I mean, you want to go back and see the Two-Face episode. Uh, Two issues, right. or the Dead Man ones, or the. What I loved is Doug wrote one about a mailman, and it was because he had an irritating mailman. <laughs> so he called me up and says, "I got this mailman. He's a jerk. I'm going to write a story about where I got a crazy ba- mailman, and Batman's got to take him out." Hmm. And it was that kind of immediacy. It wasn't about what's going on or how do we sell, how do we tap into some zeitgeist or something. It was just that. Thing. That's interesting. And, um, you know, I had said I always wanted to draw. I was really, I had seen an old film called Murders in the Rue Morgue, and I said, I want a monkey that fights Batman. I know that sounds stupid, and he wrote The Ogre and the Ape. Huh. And that is one of my favorites. That's and simple, it was huh? just, That's awesome. Yeah, it's just it's that <laughs> simple. I don't think they do comics like that anymore. I think now it is you have to have a meeting and lots of discussion and what you can do. But that eccentricity is what makes comics fun, whether it's Batman or any book. Um, the eccentricity is what's so attractive and makes it different than films and television and, and all the other forms of media. Um, comics are two guys, three guys, and – that person isn't in an audience watching it. They're by themselves generally reading it. It's So it's a very, very intimate thing. Yes. And um, kind of on a side note, you were into film and you were inspired by film noir and for your art style. I wanted to ask you about what you thought of the realism that Christopher Nolan's Batman trilogy films took. Did you- well, I always felt good about it because because in a purely self serving way, he was he was design work for him behind the scenes. Right. So the first two films in particular that I would draw j- just massive amounts of how Batman would look, his cape, little devices, uh, how the villains would look. So when he did the Scarecrow. Yes. He was looking at what we had done. The long ears and the weird cape, particularly in the first two ish, first two films. Okay. Um, so, there's yeah, stuff that... there that I go, oh, I, I was very flattered by that. Did you get, did he acknowledge you? Did he ever tell you personally? Well, DC, what they do, it's it's convoluted. What they'll do is they'll say, the studio would, would like if you could sit down and just you know, just stuff so they could look at and have an idea. How you know they used it is they send a pretty wampum big check. <laughs> and what they and then you know because they ask you not to show you the, those those things anymore. You know, uh, when with that kind of stuff because you got to remember it's work for hire. They own everything you do anyway. Right. So when they're asking for more, and in particular, how does Two Face look to you? How does the scarecrow look to you? We like what we see. Can you show us a little bit more? So when I saw Two Face, I went, "Well, that's like mine. It's really, cre- it's like half a skull." Yes. <laughs> you know, I I would go that little, and then when the people at that time would say, um, "They're requesting all your books on this," and they would like, some, "Well, yeah, okay, I'm fine." And look, whether they did or didn't, they asked, they paid. And then when I saw it, I went, okay, that's good. But it's their film. Ultimately, that's their whole baby. I'm, I'm much more interested in drawing them than designing a film or anything like that because I have control over that, you know? Yes. And I feel more connected. And, and 
more things to me can happen in a comic book oddly than in a two hundred million dollar film. Oh, absolutely. Definitely. That's I mean, that's <laughs> it's only it's taken the technology of movies to catch up to the comic books and it's not even caught up yet. No, no, and I think I think that eccentricity. Yeah. Uh Doug's Doug's odd stories are timeless because they're not tied to anything going on. If you were to read Doug and I stories now to someone who didn't know, they wouldn't know they were just that they were done twenty years ago. Right. That was something very that was consciously attempted to do. Right. Because I didn't want I didn't want to seem dated. I would look at other books coming out of that time, and they did seem very dated to me. The hairstyles and what they were saying, and general art styles, and gen, it just it just seemed, wow, these are going to be this is nineteen ninety six if if nothing else. And I didn't want that. So I did. I, uh, so I had this, I have to admit in a very, uh, serious way. I love the culty nature of the book. I'm glad they reprint them. Don't get me wrong, but I love that people would tell me they had to go hunt them down in a bin. Right. And, and that they were the books they didn't get rid of when they got rid of their collection. And that, that means a lot because you spend a month working on an issue it does mean a lot. Yeah. Well, you you did it, and obviously you converted London. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know. Sorry, London. No, I mean, come no. on. We got a That's... we got a podcast going, and and it's all traced to you. So, uh, we I guess we should thank you right now. But uh, well, you were just talking about the comics and how they're not. It's not really dated. You can read them today, and I feel like it would still flow with what's out now. What for you, what were your most memorable covers or issues that you did within your I, run? I always remembered liking the one where Batman had rats on his head. Ah, well. And that was one because they didn't really know. <laughs> they they just said, he's in a sewer, and we're not really sure because his, his books are still being written, so they didn't know. That one stuck out to me and, uh, because... <laughs> That upset me when I finished it. I'm like, wow, it was such a simple cover, and it really, it was pretty horrible. Well, I have to be honest with you, Kelly. I have the whole Nightfall series, and my biggest fear are rats, but yet I still <laughs> keep your cover right there, <laughs> and I'll look at it because <laughs> it's your artwork, and I love it, but the first time I got that cover, I screamed because all of these rats were just covering his <laughs> And it was, well, in the days uh, I did this, this is okay. So now you're opening a can here. <laughs> when I did that, I lived out in the country, okay. right? Right. And I had this big, wonderful orange cat who was my model for the Sandman cat issue. He was in all of them. In fact, I dedicated oh, it when they reprinted. Right. I dedicated it to that cat. <laughs> and he would come in through. I had a little cat door, and right at the time I was doing, they said he's in a sewer. Uh, right around that time, he comes walking in with a with a rat, oh, right, and he's right. gonna drop it and give it to me because we're out in the country, right? As a gift, and he must have found <laughs> like the granddaddy of rats because it was half his size. And for the next few days, he kept bringing these rats to me. They didn't have their heads, though, London, so it was oh, okay. Oh, oh, so that that's much better. <laughs> right. That's he 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 did remove their heads for me, but he would drop them there. And that's when they had said this thing about the sewer. It was like, okay, that that I was just having this thing with rats. <laughs> Cats bringing me headless rats. It all it was a sign from God. <laughs> this is you know you got to do this. So that one had always stuck out in my mind as um, as one of the ones. There, there's several of them uh, where part is you're pleased because there's nothing quite as fun as being under the gun. <laughs> and that you have to be creative and you don't have a ch you don't get the choice not to wait for some muse you have to get this done right you have to be you know if it's 12 o'clock by four o'clock it's got to be drawn by six o'clock it's got to be half inked by the next morning you got to be done and it's got to be packaged up and sent to them so they can get it that that afternoon the next afternoon so there's a real pleasure in that um, I have always enjoyed that kind of blue collar pressure to comics. I think, you know, frankly, if it takes you a year and a half to draw a book, it should be great. Unless, and and I'm not impressed with that. 
I am impressed with the guys who had to do it every 30 days. Do you feel that the that your best work comes from being under that pressure? Terror is a great motivator. <laughs> and and the fear of failure. Um it, it's it's I guess I, I um if I was to link it to a sports analogy, not to bore people, but it's like I I don't mind being the guy up in the bottom of the ninth. And you have to get a hit. That that focuses you pretty good. So not only is it you have to get it done, it's got to be good, is wonderful. Well, it seems to have worked um, for you, I mean, <laughs> clearly. Uh, let me ask you this real quick, because we're coming up against it. What are you working on now? Are you under the pressure now? Are, 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 oh, absolutely. are we, are we bothering you in the last minute? Uh, you know, no, that... in fact, I, in fact, what's good is though, you know what I do? I keep very, I keep regular hours, eight, eight to five. I don't work before it. I don't work after it. I don't stay up all night. So you're I've not got, working my you know, candlelight. <laughs> no, no, no. I've got wife and kids. You got it. You got to, you got to do, you got to take them to school. You got to, you're right. You know, you, yeah. you're raising kids. <laughs> So, so, and I've done that for a long time. My wife actually got me to keep regular hours and my page rates, my page uh, amount, how much work I could get done increased. Okay. And um, I never thought that was going to happen. So I always owe her a lot for that. Um, but what what happens is you do, but that doesn't mean you won't get a tight deadline. I'm, I'm right now doing a Batman series and I'm doing a Swamp Thing series at the same time. Right. So you do one in the morning of Batman or Swamp Thing and one in the afternoon. If I hadn't done the monthly in the 90s, I couldn't do it. But the <laughs> monthly in the 90s taught me how to focus. Right. And it taught me how to draw okay. more than anything else. It taught me how to draw. And because, I, oh, yes. <laughs> no, you just, you, because you can't screw up. Right. And I just I just want to say that I just saw your Dark Knight Returns 3 variant cover and it is stunning. I Well, really... thank you very much. <laughs> I love Frank Miller. No, I love Frank Miller. So, I think Dark Knight is one of the seminal books in my life. So how and, much uh, influence when... from the actual story did came t to the cover or was it just you just felt like this would fit? Because I know all the artists have different interpretations. Well, they just said the Joker's in it. <laughs> and so they said the Joker's in it. Yeah, well, do something Frankish. Do it. Can you do it like Frank? And I said, sure. You know, <laughs> um, that's not hard to do uh, To if you're a real big fan of something. Frank, no one can do what Frank Miller did. Right. Because it came from a incredibly powerful place. But what you can do is capture that same, as for me, the excitement of it. And as I was saying with what I had tried to attempt to do with Doug and I's run of making them like you could read them any time and not feel you're reading something really old. Frank's stuff was like that to me. Right. And, and so, um, and also, I think it always turns people on if I do the really short ears, just to see if I can do it. <laughs> I personally you know? love the long ears, but I understand. Me too. <laughs> I, look, I, this, the, the, the current Batman thing I'm doing, they're very long ears. Nice. Uh, you know, um, I, it became a thing where um, I always found it funny because I never thought that – you've got to remember, I see myself as a fan who's getting published. I do not see myself as a professional artist. I take it seriously. I try to be that way, but I never had any real training. I didn't go to a Joe Kubert school or an art college or anything. I just loved to draw. And it was, like I said, it was much more into film. So what, for me, it, it's, it's just one of those things where, uh, you don't, uh, how do I say this? You want that enthusiasm to come out. Right. And just be there because that's the fan quality in me. Uh, I look at the, I look at stuff in the seventies and I never thought, well, the ears here aren't, you know, and the ears there, uh, I, it, 
the cape or whoever, whatever the character was. I was always more interested in the story and how the art integrated to it. I mean, just fan. I still am that way. Um, I think that's great. I'm not into the, <laughs> I'm not, yeah, I'm just, that's, that's where the, you know, I want to see each artist has, should have their own accent. Yes. Each writer should have their own. And it, the, again, it's not, I'm like, ooh, against realism, but it's just, why homogenize when we have anything we can do should come out of these guys' brains? That's what I want to see. Right. And I just wanted to add that I believe it's coming out in November that you that there's going to be a Batman Kelly Jones Gallery Edition. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because it looks um, great. <laughs> are you talking about the... Um, uh, you, you mean the oversized thing? Yes. Um, of the, uh, oh, you mean of the first 10 issues? I think it's, yes, I think it's the first 10 of your run and it's coming out, I think, in black and white. But uh, there. Oh, you mean uh, the thing from Graffiti Press? Yes. Yes. Okay, yeah, that came out last December, I think. I think the last December or January, somewhere around there. Oh, well, there you that go. Was, it, oh, on the site. There you it go. Said, we, oh, okay. Yeah, we, we saw on the we, site it, it said, said November, two, of, November 2015. Of, yeah. So that's why I well, was Well, maybe you know something I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they're redoing a different edition. It, it, if you're talking about the um, 10 issues, the first 10 issues of my run in, in the original art type look. Yes, it's a, yes, it was original art. Okay, that... That was a thing that happened, um, I don't know, about a year and a half ago, two years uh, – yeah, I guess a year and a half ago. They, I was called by them, and they said, we have this rumor that you have a lot of your art. And I said, yes, I do. So they drove up. They were interested in seeing if it was something they would want to do. Okay. And um, at that point, they – I showed them about 15 or 20 pages. Okay. And um, I, I said, I don't know where the other – art is if they could find it so be it and they've apparently found a lot of it <laughs> um because that was the inker's allotment well um, this could possibly be a re-release yeah. <laughs> or it, which know, is... it, it could be <laughs> it could be it could be because <laughs> i i do know that the initial uh, uh amount of uh, the initial books sold out so i'm uh, i've heard that they wanted to do it again uh, on a re-release, I'm very pleased to hear that. <laughs> um, but see, you guys would know better than me because I don't really follow that stuff. They, I'm just called and say, "Where is the art?" Yeah, <laughs> this is when we're and doing then it. You, okay, I understand. Um, but it was uh, it. It's one of those things that um, I was always glad because my kids never had any clue I do any of this, and they really don't <laughs> care. You know, I just sit in a room and draw for them. In fact, they, they weren't – it wasn't until my oldest was maybe 11 years old until 12 years old until he realized I actually had a job. <laughs> he just – I guess – I mean – which I always wondered what does he tell his teachers and his friends. But um, he had just thought I drew for fun. And then I said, well, you know, I, this is what I do. And they thought it's interesting, but, you know, they're, they're into whatever they're into. Um, but I know one day – They'll be really happy to have that, you know, because uh, or at least their kids will be interested. Right. Definitely. And well, no, because, you know, that to them, I'm just, you know, the guy who says mow the lawn <laughs> or the you guy know, who, or the know, guy they, who they, says, they, no, they had, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm the one who says, did you do your homework? Don't make your mom upset. Um, so but but uh, they'll as they've gotten older. They're starting to become more interested in it. Now, do they love comics? Absolutely. They're huge Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko fans. Oh, cool. <laughs> you know, so they go through my old collections. I let them actually read the old books because that's where all the letters pages are and everything. Right. And to them, they're – so they're into all the classic stuff. Very Just not cool. Dad. <laughs> dad, why is his ear so long? <laughs> well, uh, well, then have them tune into the podcast here and then they'll get the answer. <laughs> <laughs> they will. They will. They'll finally know. They'll finally know. Well, my, you know, that's kind of the fun of it. 
to me is um, a lot of the stuff, uh, a lot of the stuff I've not done interviews, um, partly from design and partly just because I always figured it's more fun for people to figure out on their own and come to their own conclusions on stuff. Um, it, because that was the way it was for me. Right. And this, this is the I new letters really page, liked. though. This is the new yes. letters page. This is the way to. <laughs> you are right, and so. you are absolutely right. So they, it is the new letters yeah. page. I miss that. Right. Yeah. You, it's nice to have the interaction, and I got to tell you, we really appreciate you coming on the show. It's it's been wonderful for me, and I know London can't stop smiling. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I... Well, I thoroughly appreciate, it. and London, seriously. Your coming to Batman the way you did has done my heart a world of good. So um, it's something that, uh, like I said, you work long, isolated hours. And when someone tells you that, it does – it means uh, a lot. And let me tell you, it means a lot. No, thank you. You are definitely – your Batman is what I envisioned that Batman should be. With, with all well, of the different interpretations that I've seen, yours, to me, I think relates the best. That's nice. It's <laughs> deeply, deeply appreciated, and I, I respect that. Thank you very much. Great. So uh, we'd love to have you back if you could uh, <laughs> you know, make time for us in the future. And any time you want to come on, you're always welcome. Always. <laughs> Certainly. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you so much, and uh, we really appreciate it. Yes. Thank, thank you, Adam. You. Thank you, London. Thank you very uh, much. Uh,